Greetings, everyone, and welcome to podcast 14 of Solar Coaster by R. Kelly, A Diary of Me. So we're going to get into semi-pro. My career was blowing up so big until I needed a break from the craziness. I was doing too much too quick. Taking off three to four nights a week to hoop wasn't enough. There were too many things going on in my life, playing inside my head. I had to stop. I wanted to play ball full time to prove to myself that I could do something else professionally. I did it. I put my career on hold. In the 1997, at age 30, I signed up with the Atlantic City Seagulls. It was a semi-pro team in the United States Basketball League. There was no public relations stunt. I was doing it for myself. Two months before the tryouts, I started getting in shape seriously, demanding um, a program designed by coach. Man, it was torture. We got to the gym at the crack of dawn, did suicides, running up and down the court like my life depended on it. Did drills for hours on end. When it came to conditioning, I didn't play around. I got in the best shape of my life. If it weren't for the hard directions of my coach, I would never have made it. When trials rolled around, I was there, performed at the top of my game, and made the team. Some folks said I made it because I was famous, that the team thought that it would bring a bigger crowd. That might have been part of the thinking, but I know that I had what it take what it took or I wouldn't have been selected for the game. When reporters got our, on our coach for putting me on the team, he said, Rob showed up in great, sh great shape. He has an effective open jumper. He can dribble. He can read the defense. And overall, he has a fine skill set. He's also a worker. He hasn't missed a practice. Some of the guys thought he'd act like a star, but he hasn't. Rob has become one of the guys, a teammate who everyone likes. He comes and plays to win. In our first game, the highlight came when I went up on defense and smacked the ball away from forward. Nathan Morris, the singer from Boys to Men, was going to the hoop. The crowd went crazy. The crowd was usually with me when I was put in the game. In our home opener, we crushed the Connecticut Seahawks by 30 points. I only got five minutes of playing time, but as was able to draw a hard foul and make both my free throws. I soon realized that my opponents were playing extra tough against me. No one wanted to have his coach say, I can't believe R. Kelly took you to the hole, or I can't believe you let R. Kelly shoot a jumper in your face. Guys wanted to make me look bad. I can't say that I was a league leader, but I hung in the game after the game. I stayed in shape. I hit a few hard shots and mostly avoided humiliation. I believe I did myself proud. Most importantly, I knew if there were ever a time where my story would be written, a chapter within it would be called semi-pro. It's a title I wore proudly. When the season was over, there were hugs all around. My teammates and coaches all said I contributed to the championship season, and that was enough for me. Meanwhile, music was calling me back to the studio. Angel, I don't even think about it, Rob. It ain't going to happen. Why? The public sees you as an R&B thug, said the music exec. Celine Dion is a white Canadian woman with a squeaky clean image. Her people are never going to let her sing some song with the black dude from the hood. It's a ballad that I wrote for her and me. It's a love song. That makes it even worse. She won't go near it. Do you know her? I asked. I don't need to. I know how this business works. You're, ru you're running in a lane and she's running in another. What about I believe I can fly? I asked that crossed over to extra lane. Um, yes, but the but you sang that alone. Give her an R. Kelly song. She could sing alone and she probably will. Tell her you want to sing a duet with her and she'll laugh in your face. I don't believe that. I want you to get this song to her and tell her I want to sing with her. Sorry, Rob, but that's just going to be a waste of my time. I left that meeting feeling discouraged but not defeated. The exec didn't know what I knew. Celine was supposed to do this song. I wrote it shortly after my first daughter, Joanne, was born. My baby had asthma. One night she was coughing and wouldn't stop coughing. After she was calm and sleeping, I looked down on her and said, man, she's an angel. A song was about to be birthed. As I wrote it, I heard C Celine's voice all over it. It had to be. I didn't hear anybody else's voice on that song. I had my own connects. I did. I got the song to Celine on my own. 
A week later, I was in the studio when an assistant handed me a note that said, Celine Dion is on the phone. Robert, she asked, may I call you Robert? Of course. May I call you Celine? Yes. And may I tell you that I absolutely love this song. I'm Your Angel is a beautiful song. I understand that you like to sing it with me. I'd love to. If you hear us doing it together, I don't hear it any other way. Will you come to Canada? I want you to meet my husband and my family. I think you'll like the recording facilities here. A week later, I was there. Canada was beautiful and so was Celine's family. Everyone was gracious. The season, the session was a breeze. Celine was happy to let me produce that song the way I envisioned it. We were in total harmony. I'm your angel soared up to the charts. When Celine was booked in Vegas, she invited me to her show. She got me a killer suite and treated me VIP all the way. Her show was off the chain. When the music executive called to congratulate me on the success of the song, the same executive who'd been convinced that she'd never sing it with me, I accepted his best wishes. I wanted him to tell him that he'd been full of shit, but I didn't have to. He already knew. I'm Your Angel came out on the R album along with I Believe I Can Fly. It would be my last album of the 90s. I'd written so much new material that the CD was two discs with 29 tracks. The single that popped out first was If I Could Turn Back the Hands of Time in contrast to the club jams time was old school. I'd like to think it's a song that Sam Cooke could have sung. I have originally written it years before for my girlfriend, Lanice. Then my mom died. I revisited the song and it suddenly had a deeper meaning. I kept revisiting it over the years changing a note here on a lyric there. I always felt it was one of those forever songs, but like all stories, I knew it would have a special place in time. If I could only be patient, the spirit would tell me when it was time to release it. It came out a special time in my life. In 1998, Drea had given birth to our daughter, Joanne, named after my mom. What a moment. For years, people would tell me, Rob, we, had, we, we made babies to your music. I had achieved one of the goals I set back on my porch with my mom and her friends. Well, I got I got to the point where I wanted to make babies of my own. When I learned Drea was pregnant, I was overjoyed. My dream of a family was coming true. I got to confess, though, that the night Drea went to the hospital, I didn't go with her. I'm one of those brothers who can't handle participating in the actual birth. It's a little too intense and the stakes are a bit too high for me if anything goes wrong. Birth is God's great miracle, and I thank him for the gift, but the Lord and I have agreed that I've, I'm supposed to head to the hospital after the baby is born and everyone's all cleaned up. So I pace the floor at Rock and Roll McDonald's near the hospital downtown Chicago. Rock and Roll McDonald's is about the nicest McDonald's there. There is. You can be comfortable sitting there for hours. So while Drea was dealing with labor, I was drinking coffee with three creams and six sugars feeling very nervous until they came and told me that at last I was a father. The first thing I saw in in the face of my beautiful, gorgeous daughter was the face of my mother, Joanne, looked like Joanne. Thank you, God. Two years later, our second daughter, Jaya, was born. And three years after that, our son, Robert Jr., all three times had me waiting at Rock and Roll McDonald's. All three times had me running to the hospital when word came about the baby being born. All three times had tears flowing in my eyes as I looked into the eyes of my children. They were, are, and will always be the greatest blessing in my life. I adore my kids. When they were crawling on the floor, I crawled around with them, making a fool out of myself to make them laugh. When they got older and started talking, I found ways to keep them laughing. I played the games they played, watched the cartoons they watched. I love being a father. In the beginning, Dre and I found ways to keep our love alive. One afternoon, I drove her 25 miles south of Chicago on Interstate 57. When we got off the highway, I had her put on a blindfold. Why, she asked. You'll see, I said. I pulled up in front of the giant gates of the mansion I had seen when I was 17 years old and a nobody. The same mansion I swore that one day would be mine. It had changed hands since I had first seen it and was no longer the McDonald's house. The guy who I bought it from owned a black hair products company. He turned the original house into Olympia Fields Castle. 
with the casino and marble fountains and all the kinds of things in it. So I tore down the house and had a new one custom built from the ground up. A surprise I'd been working on in secret for months. I just shot a music video and the location was kind of a ski lodge. I love that warm, cozy feel, so I took that look and remixed it. You can take off your blindfold now, I told Drea. Right there in front of her, beyond the gate, was the biggest house she had ever seen. The grounds were enormous. It's ours, I said. It's for our family. She didn't know what to say. Our dreams are coming true, Drea, I said. The fairy tale is real. I wanted the fairy tale to last forever. On Valentine's Day, I gave a big party and invited our friends. We had a picnic on the lawn, and at a designated time, a helicopter flew over. I gave the sign, and suddenly hundreds of red roses came falling out of the sky. It was raining red roses. Boxes with earrings and purses came down for the ladies, and for Drea, there was an oversized Gucci suitcase with, fur in, with furs inside. That was a good day. Other days weren't so good. The love between Drew and me was under strain. Part of that was my fault because I never was your conventional husband. People look at celebrities like they're not human, but I'm just like the next man. I see fine women every day. Sometimes I'm like, wow, wouldn't it be nice? It's the way I was raised. I'm human. I'm flawed. I'm a man. I've always carried two cell phones. One was for family calls, the other for non-family calls. Coming out of the gym one day, I mistakenly thought I had hung up on Drea when I took a call on a non-family phone. It was a woman. I was sweet talking. Drea heard the whole thing. I tried to play it off, but couldn't. Finally, Drea just said, Robert, Kelly, do you have something to tell me? I do, and I'm sorry. I was sorry that I didn't stop partying like I should have. I should have been a one-woman man, and I wasn't. Another part of our problem came from Drea's love of dancing. That love got stronger and stronger. From the start of our marriage, I made it clear that I needed a woman to raise our children and be, and be my best friend and biggest supporter. This was the idea I had put in the song Homie Lover Friend off 12 Play. I couldn't fool myself. I always knew I wanted a stay-at-home wife to make my life work. Drea understood and being a strong person, she tried her best. But when we were to see plays like The Lion King or dance companies like Alvin Ailey, American Dance Theater, the choreography thrilled her and reminded her how badly she wanted to get back into show business. After one show, I made the biggest mistake of our marriage by introducing her to Debbie Allen. Debbie is Drea's idol. Meeting her was one of the truest highlights of her life. I could feel the inspiration pass through Drea, Debbie into Drea. On one hand, that was great. On the other hand, it made Drea even unhappier because she wasn't able to dance full time. The time she helped me choreograph my shows weren't enough for me. She wanted to fulfill her own gifts. She wanted to get back into dance by employing a full-time teacher to give her private instructions. Naturally, I was leery. I saw his picture. He was a good-looking guy, all cut and buff. You don't have to worry, said Drea. Her word, though, wasn't enough for me. I went to meet the dude. Nice guy and real honest, too. What are you doing talking to the man, she asked. Look, I said, he's got this real touchy-feely technique of teaching, and I have to uh, right to know who the guy is. You got no right to stop me from studying with him. I got every right. The dance instructor became a huge issue. It caused heavy resentment, but I put my foot down. Then I came up with a way to make things right. I'm buying you a dance studio, I said to Drea. A studio? A whole studio? What am I going to do with the studio? Whatever you like, baby. You can teach there. You can rehearse there. You can put on recitals there. It's all yours. I'm even going to help you design it, but you'll take the lead. It happened for a while. The studio made Drea happy. It got her back to dancing. It channeled her energy and gave her a new canvas for her creativity. It was a healthy and helpful professional outlet for her. Our relationship, though, was continually changing. Maybe it was me. Maybe it was her. Whatever it was, no matter how we adored our kids, no matter how hard we tried, the waters got rougher. Then the boat sprung a leak that kept getting bigger. The more we tried to bail out of the water to keep us afloat, the more water we took on. Neither of us wanted this marriage to go under, but what we could but what could we do to keep it from sinking? My relationship with Drea wasn't in good shape, but I was determined to rise to 
to the challenge. How could I turn up the heat? <clears throat> Contagious. I was working on my new record when Ronald and er Ernie Isley came to town. Ever since Ron debuted in the role of Mr. Biggs in our video for Down Low, he'd been rolling. The Isley Brothers brand was back. Now they were looking for another hit. Wish I had one, I said, but right now I've been pushing hard on other stuff. I'm really tapped out. That's when the Isleys told me they just had a death in their family and they needed something to lift their spirits. I understood, I said, but nothing's popping off in my head. Can't you make it pop off? Asked Ernie, who was getting angry. Aren't you the guy who could knock off the hits just like that? Well, Rob's creativity artist, said Ron, taking up my part and creativity ain't something you can turn on like a faucet. He's done it before, said Ernie. Don't see why he can't do it again. Rob don't need that kind of pressure, said Ron. Or maybe he does, said Ernie. It wasn't in any fun listening to the brothers arguing. It's better. I have some time alone, I said, to figure out a song for y'all. Once I get it, I'll call you. We got a plane to catch in two hours, said Ernie. You sure you can't do it before we leave? I'm sure, I said. No worries, said Ron. You'll hit us when we get it. I will. We said goodbye and the brothers headed out to the airport. I started listening and filling my music into the music. I understood that Ernie was down because of the death of his family. He was sad and wanted something to lift him up. I got that. But his feelings toward me were harsh and angry and I was glad he was gone because that feelings could be contagious. Contagious. The word stuck with me. Interesting word. Interesting concept. Interesting experience. An interesting story that could link up to where down low left off. I went to the keyboard and started fooling around with the little melody. The melody captured me and then the story started to flow. It's 2 a.m. I'm just getting into um, about to check my messages. No one is called but my homies and some bill collectors. I two way her. She don't hit me back. Something is funny. So I call her mother's house and ask her if she's seen my baby. Roll my six around looking for that missing lady get back in turn the tv on and caught the news then i put my hand on my head because i'm so confused then i turned the tv down because i thought i heard a squeaky sound something's going on upstairs and i know nobody's there bump 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 as i get closer to the stairways all i hear is my baby's voice in my ear screaming you're contagious touch me baby give me what you got and then a man said, sexy lady, drive me crazy, drive me wild. Contagious was the name of the song. Contagious was what I'd been looking for. Contagious was perfect for the Isleys. Get Ronald Isley on the phone, I told my assistant. A couple of minutes later, my assistant called. They're at the airport. They're about to get on the plane. Tell them not to. Tell them to turn around and come back to the studio. They came, listened to Contagious and, uh, Contagious and fell immediately in love with the song. When we gonna do it, asked Ernie. Now, I said, just like that, he said, reminding me of what he said before. Yes, sir, I said, just like that. A few weeks later, the record dropped and blew up. After all, it was contagious. Insecurity is also contagious. I encountered a lot of insecurity when I worked on songs inspired by the Martin Lawrence Eddie Murphy movie called Life for Maxwell, an up and coming R&B singer. Wyclef John did the score while I wrote and produced 10 original songs for the soundtrack album. I used artists I love. I had the great Kelly Price sing, It's Gonna Rain. The Isleys did Speechless. DJ Quick and I did It's Like Every Day. Brian McKnight sang Discovery. And Trisha Yearwood, the wonderful country singer, did Follow the Wind. When it came time for the title song, Life, I heard it for Casey and JoJo. When Maxwell heard Life, though he wanted to sing it. This is a hardcore song I told him about a long time in jail. It's not something you're going to relate to. I relate to the fact that that it's the title song, he said. Makes no difference, bro. I wrote a song for you that's just as good, even better. But it's not the title song. Just listen to it, I said. I play fortunate. I knew the song was killer. Record this, I said, and you'll have a smash. You'll be able to tour behind it for the rest of your life. I still like that life track. Forget it, life. Cut fortunate. I don't think so, he said. I pulled, I pulled out. If you don't want to sing it, I will. But then his manager called and said Maxwell had changed his mind. 
He had a little pad he wanted to add to the song. Was that okay with him? It's all good. I said, I'm telling you, the song's a smash. Maxwell's version of Fortunate went number one. It was one of the biggest hits of 1999 and won the Billboard Awards, the Soul Train Award, and the Grammy nomination. Okay, thank you so much for joining this podcast. And tomorrow we're going to be talking about the world's greatest. What do you think about um, the contagious conversation with Ronald Isley and um, the Isley brothers and and how Celine Dion really acknowledged him when other people were trying to hate on him during that time. You know, he had a lot of things that if he didn't have high confidence, he had extreme high confidence in his career, but that did not drive over into his personal life. I think he had low self-esteem um, when it came down to his everyday mundane life. I think that's why he had the issue with the um, choreography choreographer for Drea Kelly. What do you think about him being a father? I mean, what's some of your feelings about that? Um, as he talked about, you know, how things were and what he couldn't take, you know, we could go all the way back to the girl when he was in the room and, uh, how in that situation when they were having sex and she started to ministrate, but um, these are things that really and truly happened in this man's life, and he's not holding back anything. So I thank you so much for your comments, your likes, your shares, your subscribes. And um, yeah, so we'll keep on going, and we'll see you tomorrow with the world's greatest.